Hello gang, we're here to cover uh, section 1.9, which is all about inverse functions. And our objectives. First, we want to be able to find an inverse function informally and verify that two functions are in fact inverse in, in functions of each other. We also want to be able to use graphs of functions to determine whether functions have inverse functions, so it's kind of like a shortcut to determine whether a function exists. And that involves using the horizontal line test to determine if the functions are one-to-one. -one. And then the last thing we want to do is find inverse functions algebraically. All right, so what do we mean by inverse functions? Every single time that you learned a new math operation, the next thing you learned was the opposite of it. First you learned adding, and then it was subtracting. First you learned multiplication, and then it was division. First you learned how to take squares, and then you learned how to take square roots. Those opposite operations are actually inverse operations. Every mathematical operation has its own inverse. But what if there's more than one operation? The examples that I gave you, first you learned adding and then subtracting, first multiplication, then division. What if there's a problem that involves three operations, multiplication, addition, and squaring? Can there, can there still be an inverse to it? And the answer is yes. When one more, I have to keep in mind that when one or more operations are performed on a number, that's part of the criteria to be a function. So to undo it requires an inverse function, not a single operation, but possibly a combination of operations, and that is the inverse function. Now there's several inter interesting aspects of functions that we're going to learn about in this section. First is about domain and range. And this is going to be kind of tricky to understand. Hopefully I'll give you a simple example that puts it all together. When a function is performed on a number, recall that the set of input values was called the domain and the set of output values was called the range. The domain was all of the x values that were used. The range is all the resulting y values. An inverse function is completely backward from the normal function. That is, the domain of the inverse is what the range of the original was. And the range of the inverse is what the domain of the original was. I get it. It doesn't make sense yet, but it will. Take the following example. If the domain of f of x is negative 1, 2, 3, 6, and 10. And the range is 1, 7, 9, 15, 23. Then the inverse function, which is notated like this, and that's called f inverse of x. It's not f minus 1. The inverse function would have the following. Its domain would be 1, 7, 9, 15, 23, exactly what the range of the original was. And the range of the inverse would be what the domain was of the original. And remember, inverse functions undo each other. So if we plugged an x into the original, it would kick out a specific y. If we then took that y and plugged it into the inverse, it would kick out the original x right back where we started. It should completely undo the original function. So before I, I give you this idea in a, in a little schematic, let me just give you this real simple example and see if this helps. I get we haven't gone over the definition yet, but let's just say that f of x 
is x plus 2. And that the domain is 6. Well, what that means is when you plug 6 in to the function, you get 8. That is the range. The inverse function, instead of being x plus 2, logically it's x minus 2. And if we take and plug in the number that we just got, that would be the domain of the inverse, 8 minus 2 is 6, that is the range of the inverse. Okay, and keep in mind, we ended up, let me change colors here, we ended up exactly where we started. This function right here completely undid that function, leaving us right back where we started. That's the idea behind the domain and the range of the regular function and the inverse function. So in a schematic, it looks a little bit like this. You have the, your domain of the original function x, and you perform an operation on it, or put it through a function f. And it results in the range of f, a y value, which we notate as f of x. Well, now that acts as the domain of the inverse function. And it goes undergoes the inverse function, and it takes us right back to x. Okay, so the domain of f will be the same as the range of f inverse. And the range of f will be the uh, domain of f inverse. All right, hopefully this is making sense. If not, we'll keep working at it. But let's go to what the definition of an inverse function is. Let f and g be two functions. There should be an s there. Such that f of g of x equals x. You should remember this is a composite function. We just did that in the last section f of g of x equals x for every x in the domain of g. And the opposite is true. g of f of x equals x for every x in the domain of f. Under these conditions, the function g is the inverse function of the function f. And again, that inverse function is noted by, notated by that f raised to the negative 1, but you read it as f inverse. All right, so when you make a composite function of f and its inverse, it's going to give you x. When you make a composite function of f and its inside the inverse, it also gives you x. That's the definition of an inverse function. All right, so... Uh, I gave you an example a second ago about x plus 2. That was a simple example of an inverse function, something that you can um, figure out intuitively. So I'm going to give you a set of four functions here, and I want you to take a second to write down what you think the inverse function is. So you should pause the video right now. Okay, so if I start by multiplying x by 6, the opposite of that is to divide x by 6. So f inverse of x is x divided by 6. If the original is to subtract 12, the inverse will be to add 12. 
Here I'm multiplying by one-fifth, which is really the same as taking x divided by 5. So the opposite of x divided by 5 is 5x. And the last one, the opposite of cubing is cube rooting. So if there's a single operation like there is in this case, you should be able to intuitively figure out what the inverse is. When there's more operations than one, we're going to have to do some algebraic things, and that's going to be on a video later. All right, so others will be more difficult to prove, and we're going to have to do that algebraically. But that's the end of this video. See you next time.